everyone, uh, Lisa Ackerman. I'm the vice president here at World Monuments Fund. And I have the easiest job tonight, which is just to welcome everybody and thank them for coming. And I'm going to turn it very quickly over to my colleague, Sarah Schur, and our speaker, Vivian Mann. But I just wanted to make a few very brief remarks because this is a lecture series that we started when we moved into this building in uh, two years ago. But this is our very first Jewish Heritage Lecture since we moved into our new space here at the Empire State Building. And so this is really a special moment for a lot of us who've really cared about the Jewish Heritage Program for a long time. And I see many old friends in this audience and people who were on the Jewish Heritage Council in the 1980s and 1990s when we had that um, body as a way to promote this program and think about its goals. And um, for many people, they've thought that the Jewish Heritage Program has gone rather quiet in recent years, but we've been working away at many sites around the world. And I hope that you'll have chances to learn more about that in the months and years to come. And one of the great moments uh, in 2012 for us was an opportunity to once again hire a full-time staff member devoted to the Jewish Heritage Program. And that's Sarah Schur, who started with us in July. And when we had this opportunity to create this new position, I will say, even though we went through the proper um, procedures for hiring somebody, the very first thought I had was, we must hire Sarah because she was just the perfect person um, with such a passion for Jewish culture and heritage in its broadest terms and um, a degree in preservation from Columbia University. So really tailor-made for this opportunity. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and um, we'll have some time for questions and answers and of course a brief reception afterwards and I hope this is the first of many such lectures on the Jewish Heritage Program that we are inaugurating. With that, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and good evening. Um, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Sarah Schur, and it's a pleasure to be here and welcome you to this evening's lecture, uh, Jewish Islamic Art and Architecture, Spain and North Africa, presented by Dr. Vivian Mann. Um, so D WMF's Jewish Heritage Program has a tremendous legacy with over 50 projects in 25 different countries encompassing not just physical conservation but also advocacy and interpretation projects that address broader issues affecting Jewish heritage preservation. And before we begin tonight's program, I want to briefly introduce you to our two current Jewish heritage conservation projects uh, that build on this legacy. Uh, the first one is Subotitsa Synagogue in Serbia. Constructed in 1902, it's a stunning Art Nouveau structure uh, that's really an architectural highlight of the region. WMF has been working on this site for a few years in partnership with Subotitsa's Jewish community, which still has 250 members, and the municipality of Subotitsa. Uh, in 2010, we completed work on the, the roof, the dome, and the cupolas, and currently we're working on conserving the exterior facades, and you can see some of the progress right here. Uh, since WMF has started working on the site, the synagogue has become a central feature of a regional tourism program between Serbia and Hungary, and it draws both local and international visitors to explore its beauty and history. Our other current conservation project is Knesset Eliyahu Synagogue, uh, which is the oldest Sephardic synagogue in Mumbai, India. WMF is partnering with the synagogue's active congregation to address the structure's conservation. Uh, we initially funded a conditions assessment um, that was completed in, at the end of 2010, and we're about to begin work on developing a plan to conserve its 19th century English stained glass windows. Um, and if you'd like to receive more information about these two projects, uh, and you did not receive one of these hard copy invitations in the mail, make sure at the end of the lecture to sign up in the back uh, so that you can receive our new beautiful Jewish Heritage Program brochure uh, that'll be coming out in the next week or two. Uh, now, without further ado, it's my honor to introduce, doc introduce Dr. Vivian Mann. Uh, Dr. Vivian B. Mann is director of the master's program in Jewish art and visual culture at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Previously, she was Morris and Eva Feld chair of Judaica at the Jewish Museum, where she created numerous exhibitions in their catalogs, among them Convivencia, Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Medieval Spain, and most recently, Morocco, Jews and Art in a Muslim Land. In 2000, her Jewish text on the visual arts was published by Cambridge University Press, and in 2005, Art and Ceremony in Jewish Life, Essays in the History of Jewish Art, was published by Pindar Press. Her most recent book, Uneasy Communion, Jews and Altarpieces in Medieval Spain, appeared in 2010 in conjunction with an exhibition at the Museum of Biblical Art, New York. Dr. Mann has been a recipient of the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship 
NEA Fellowship for Museum Professionals, NEH Fellowship for Research, and the NEH Collaborative Projects Grant for Interpretive Research with Richard I. Cohen. She's also been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies of the Hebrew University. In 1999, Dr. Mann was awarded the Jewish Cultural Achievement Award in Jewish Thought by the National Foundation for Jewish Culture for her successful art efforts at establishing a master's program in Jewish art and for her scholarship in the field. In 2007, Dr. Mann co-founded Images, a journal in Jewish art and visual culture, the first American journal for Jewish art. In 2010, Mann was elected a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research, the oldest professional organization in the field of Jewish studies in North America. And on a personal note, uh, Dr. Mann was my history of synagogue architecture professor when I was studying at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And her enthusiasm for synagogue art and architecture motivated me to pursue a career in Jewish heritage preservation. Um, and she's a large part of the reason why I'm here tonight. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Vivian Mann. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's, I just realized 24 years since I had lunch with Bonnie Burnham, <laughs> uh, director of the World Monuments Fund, and she said, we need a new project uh, in Italy. And um, that's how this all came to be. So I am, I, it's the only time in my life I felt like a power broker. <laughs> okay. um, I would like to orient you first um, geographically and historically. Uh, the map, as many of you probably recognize, is Morocco. And I brought it to indicate how close Morocco, and, uh, North Africa, and Spain are. When you stand on the hill that is the Jewish cemetery in Tetuan, you can actually see Gibraltar you know, if, the, if it's a clear day. So some of the places I'm going to be uh, talking about are Shipshawan, Tetuan, um, Marrakesh, I'm sure most of you know, and, uh, and so forth. The Muslim rule over North Africa began with the conquest of Egypt in 641. After several campaigns, the remainder of the coastal regions came under Arab dominion by 709. From North Africa, Islamic forces established a beachhead on Gibraltar by seven, and by 711 they had conquered all of the Iberian Peninsula except for a small northern portion and they renamed it Al-Andalus. The path of these conquests was one way in which artistic and architectural culture was transmitted from Egypt through North Africa to Iberia. Another was through the travel of individuals. Artists brought their knowledge and skills. Works of art came along with traders and immigrants, influencing cultural developments in new homelands. In the case of Spain and North Africa, I think it's very important to note that travel and cultural influences flowed also from north to south. Prior to 1492 and 1497, uh, the expulsions of the Jews from Spain and Portugal, two other historical events influenced Jews to leave the Iberian Peninsula. The first was the invasion in the 12th century of Almohad and Almoravid tribes from North Africa whose strict and intolerant Islamic beliefs led to anti-Jewish measures. I think the most famous refugees of this period were Maimonides and his family, who reversing the path of the conquering Arab armies, settled first in Fez, which is also, um, that's not on this, oh, here it is, here, and then moved to Fustat, which was, um, the name for medieval Cairo. The second event that resulted in Jewish emigration were the pogroms of 1391 that were inspired by the preaching of Dominican and Franciscan friars. It is estimated that one third of the Jews of Spain died in 1391, one third converted to Christianity and one third remained Jews, many of whom fled south. Finally, as the result of the Christian reconquest of Spain, 
Muslim left the northern regions and uh, traveled to Andal uh, Andalusia, which was contracted into the very south of the peninsula. The movements of populations back and forth across the Mediterranean led to the creation of a common Maghribi culture. The Maghreb is another name for North Africa. And this common culture existed in many areas of the arts. For example, architecture, manuscript illumination, stucco carving, wood, and textiles, which are the major categories of Islamic art. And this is in contrast to the traditional categories of our history, which are uh, famously Eurocentric and consist largely of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Uh, under new approaches to art history, there is now value being given to what were the traditional and major art forms of places uh, like the countries under Muslim rule. But I think there has yet to be widespread recognition of the artistic participation of minorities in Islamic art and the place of works made for other faiths within the field. One exception, I'm sure most of you have seen it, are the new galleries of Islamic art in the Metropolitan Museum, newly reinstalled in 2011. It includes Hebrew, they include Hebrew manuscripts decorated with uh, Islamic style ornament and Hindu art in Islamic style as well. In most Western texts on Islamic art, however, the emphasis is always on architecture and its decoration that were made for Muslim use, on objects made for Muslim worship or study, and in homes that are never specified but presumably belong to Muslims. Ignored in these writings is the fact that countries ruled by Muslims were from the very beginning multicultural societies that included both Jews and Christians. The late Islamicist Ola Grabar was one of the few to recognize the role of minorities. He wrote, Islamic art does not refer to the art of a particular religion, for a vast proportion of the monuments have little or anything to do with the faith of Islam. Works of art demonstrably made by and for non-Muslims can be appropriately studied as works of Islamic art. There is, for instance, a Jewish Islamic art since large Jewish communities lived within the predominantly Muslim world. And in the Middle Ages, 90% of Jews lived in Muslim countries. Europe was just 10%. Islamic art then is art that is created in a society dominated by Islam or art from the world of Islam. But it is not Muslim art, only Muslim art. As a result of their long history living in the world of Islam, which go, went back to pre-Muslim uh, societies, Jews were closely integrated with the majority, even living in the same apartment complexes. Social integration extended to Jews who were businessmen and artists. Jews were engaged in the same arts and also crafts as non-Jews, as attested to by documents from the Cairo Geniza, that repository for old texts which was found in the Ben Ezra synagogue. And they are also found in rabbinic responsa. These are questions uh, and answers given by rabbis to issues of Jewish law. All these texts mention goldsmiths, weavers, glassblowers, scribes, and other artists and in all of these occupations, Jews worked together with Muslims and formed interreligious partnerships. Um, there, there's a, a whole famous response of, of Maimonides in which he's asked, well, this Jew and this Muslim work together. One is a glassblower and one's a metalsmith. And 
what should ha is this okay and what should how should they share the profits that are made on the sabbath and he said it's fine that they're partners but the jew should not benefit from what is done on the sabbath and presumably the muslim did or did not benefit from what was done on <laughs> friday um there's another text in, from the Geniza that from the 10th or 11th century that uh, talks about a silk weaver who employed Muslims, a Jew, and a Jewish convert to Islam. Now that is tolerance. <laughs> um, okay. As an example of um, the kind of work that Jews probably did is this uh, silk textile. And the reason that we know um, that uh, Jews worked in silk is because of another responsum that was asked of the rabbi of Barcelona in the 13th century. And he was asked, uh, Jewish women in Toledo make silks that incorporate crosses. Is this OK? And he answered that since nobody worships crosses that are woven into a garment, um, there's no problem with it. And I can say to you, this is probably the silk that they were talking about because of the fact that there's a very limited number of patterns in medieval Spanish textiles there that were produced on the Iberian Peninsula in the Middle Ages. They're, they're, maybe 12 or 15 patterns, and this is one of them, and the only one uh, with crosses embedded in the weaves. But to discuss the kind of transmission of art that I mentioned before, I want to turn to manuscripts. One of the most treasured portable works of art was Holy Scripture. The passage of decorative systems for Korans and Bibles from Egypt to North Africa, from North Africa to Spain, and possibly after the expulsions back to North Africa, are vivid examples of the tra transmission of artistic traditions during the Middle Ages. The earliest examples of decorated scripture are Korans of the 8th century and Hebrew Bibles of the 9th and 10th. They are usually, as you can see in the, uh, in the Bible at the right, uh, which is in the British Library, usually vertically oriented um, and incorporate text markers in the form of, let me see if I can do this. Oh, good. No, I can. There we go. All right. Um, so you see the text markers are in the form of lines of ornament that separate uh, portions or verses of the text. In Qurans, the markers were sometimes circles or flowers, and you, you can see that here. And the example on your left is actually from, um, thought to be from Marrakesh, uh, but definitely from Morocco, um, and dates around 1300. So that this early type of Quran and Bible continued in the Maghreb because that was a very traditional area and they clung uh, long after other people had passed on to other shapes and forms of these books, they clung to old uh, traditions. Um, okay. In the 9th century and 10th century, a new type arose uh, in Egypt and then was transmitted to the West uh, the new format uh, had, which remained popular for a very long time, was oblong in shape with only a few lines of text on each side of a folio. This new form, because of the writing of only a few lines of text, was a deluxe and expensive manuscript requiring many animal skins. And it's further distinguished by uh, the incorporation of a very differentiated system of markers and vowel signs to ensure an accurate reading of the text. In both Jewish and Muslim circles, the, the 10th and 11th centuries was a period of intense interest in having a correct uh, text. Bands of gold ornament uh, in, I'm 
I'm sorry, I'll get the hang of this, I guess. Uh, bands of gold ornament, which you can see here that end in palmettes are typical, and here is an example of the rosette, uh, and there are other flower uh, forms also. Uh, in this Hebrew manuscript, which is just a chapter of the Bible, it's Lech uh, it is, oh, excuse me, Shach which is a part of, uh, of, of the Bible, and the whole manuscript dates 1106 to 1107. Now, the incorporation of full pages of ornament uh, in Bibles and Korans became standard from the 10th century on. Uh, these used to be called carpet pages, but uh, because their design, their overall design, which can continue ad infinitum like a rug, um, what led to the term. Now there's been a correction, and they're called frontispieces and finispieces because they uh, mark the beginning and the end of the text, and sometimes important pages. So you could. In the Schlachlachor manuscript, there is actually a decorated page before the colophon, which was uh, of great importance in giving information on the copying of the Bible. Uh, as you can see, the motifs of, of Korans and Bibles of the 10th and 11th centuries are very similar. Uh, one popular design are repeated rows of small flowers which you see here on the left, and also in this border of this box Quran, which is, um, was illustrated in both its box and, and outside. Uh, they were used in several manuscripts of the 10th and 11th century, and they were used on marriage contracts, Jewish marriage contracts, which are always um, before the modern era handwritten. And they later appear in the Bible at the left, which was written and decorated in Spain in 1384. It's in the British Library and was the first Bible acquired by the kings of England. It is known as the King's Bible, dated 1384. Another composition that appears in um, both Korans and Bibles uh, exemplifies the back and forth movement of artistic motifs between uh, Spain and North Africa. The center is a rosette, as you see it in a very early Hebrew, uh, decorated Hebrew manuscript. I'm sorry. This is the, on the right, is the second Leningrad Bible um, of 1008 to 9. And it consists of the center with uh, projecting rays. If you can notice, all of the rays are uh, formed or outlined in micrographic script and actually are verses from the Bible and from other texts which have the meaning that God is the center and man is at the periphery and it is the, the rays are the path from which uh, emanations from God reach man. This composition uh, continued to be, to be created in North Africa. Uh, as you can see on the left, this is a, a Quran from uh, the Maghreb dated uh, to the 14th century. It then appears in Spain and then comes back to Morocco, appears again in Morocco in the 16th century, whether that's a continuation of earlier traditions or a, a coming back from Spain, we don't know. The same composition was also tooled on leather book bindings for, uh, for Bibles and Korans. In effect, there is one common culture in the book arts uh, that exists and, and other arts between Spain and North Africa. It's called Maghribi culture. And the manuscripts, because the, the writing of these manuscripts is the same in North Africa as in Spain, uh, that one can't tell them apart, and they're simply called Maghribi uh, manuscripts. I'd like to turn now uh, to architecture. Oh, all right. These are exam other examples. Let me just go um, back to this. 
this is an, uh, an, another example of the carryover from Egypt that reaches Spain, the transmission of, of compositions. On the right is a um, slide I took of it through, through Mylar, so you will excuse it. It's the colophon of a manuscript, and you can see that basically it's formed of a diamond pattern that overlays the whole thing. And actually, the, the lines of the text uh, equal the colophon. He says, I am so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the grandson of so-and-so, we were all scribes. And the date, and actually, he, he specifies the hour when he finished this on a manuscript on a certain day. And at the left is a more developed uh, uh, page with a more developed composition in which the diagonal lines are now bands and where they intersect you get stars. But the basic uh, idea for this in the Spanish manuscript uh, at the left goes back to, as you can see, back to uh, Egypt um, where the right one was, was written. Uh, the left one is a 15th century manuscript uh, in Spain. And here's a, another example of the same composition. Of the one on the left is a Koran from southern Spain, from Andalusia, dated 1300. The one on the right is a 15, uh, 14th century Koran from uh, Morocco. So there was this constant common culture which was expressed in manuscripts. I want to turn now uh, to architecture. There are only a few medieval synagogues that remain from the, uh, all those that existed in lands under Islamic rule, which as I said was home to most of world Jewry during the Middle Ages. In some cases, as with the Benezra synagogue in Cairo that was um, restored in 1979 uh, in celebration of the peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, uh, the earlier original 11th century building was hidden under later rebuildings. Nearly complete synagogues from the Middle Ages exist only in Spain. Uh, the earliest is in Toledo. On the left, it is known as Santa Maria La Blanca because this is what it was named um, after 3991 when it was taken over by the church. It was built in 1295, probably by Joseph Ben Mayer Ben Shoshan, who was the finance minister to Alfonso VIII of Castile. Could I drop you for the water? Okay. Um, it consists of five parallel aisles separated by rows of piers um, that can be seen here. Okay, they support ornate capitals. Thank you. In stucco with horseshoe uh, that crown horseshoe arches. The same plan uh, appeared slightly earlier in the 12th century in a mosque now in this condition in Tinmal, Morocco. It may be that the plan originated in Morocco, but in any case, uh, it became very popular in Spain, as we can see by the fact that not only was it used in Santa Maria La Blanca at the right, but it was also used in Segovia, in a smaller synagogue that had only three aisles uh, and which uh, suffered fire and was torn down in 1399. That two examples of the same synagogue plan existed in major cities of Al-Andalus suggests that other similar buildings may have uh, existed. Santa Maria La Blanca and the Segovia Synagogue are examples of the incorporation of an Islamic architectural plan that is divorced from its original religious function. And it is a puzzle looking at it to know where they might have put the reader's desk and the Torah ark, the ark for the scrolls, which are necessary in a synagogue. In 1314-15, 
that is a slightly after Santa Maria La Blanca. <coughs> Isaac Mahab of Cordoba built a smaller synagogue with a vestibule, um, which is, okay, the vestibule is here, and above it is the women's gallery. The sanctuary is small, um, no bigger than this room, if not smaller. Uh, and as you can see, its walls are covered with elaborate stucco decorations in various patterns. The same motifs uh, also appear uh, in, uh, I'll show you, in 14th century Christian buildings and in the Alhambra. Uh, but I want to first point out that similar uh, stucco was also used in other synagogues. These are remains from the synagogue in Cuenca, Spain, uh, that was converted into a church again in 1391 and was the place of worship of Jews who had converted to Christianity. Uh, here is a comparison of the interior uh, stucco on, um, you can see here, with a panel in a contemporaneous 14th century uh, convent, which is also in, in Cordoba. And you can see the, the um, dominant outer surface behind which are leaves and, and arabesques. Um, created in such a way as to give a feeling of depth and, and three-dimensionality to the design. Uh, a little bit later in 1357, Samuel Halevi Abalafia, treasurer to King Pedro the Cruel, which is not a misnomer, um, because I built this synagogue uh, in Toledo, which is known as El Transito. And why I made the joke was that uh, as soon as the synagogue was finished, he, he um, executed uh, Halevi because he said he must have stolen in order to be able to have built such a rich house of worship. Okay, fragments of the same stucco that you see um, here as you can see, exist also in this 14th uh, century portion of the Alhambra. So this was indeed extremely uh, fine work. The use of Islamic style stucco decorations continued even after the reconquest of Spain. This is the these are the ruins on the left of a newly discovered in in um, 1998 of a synagogue in Lorca, which is in the south in the province of Murcia. Uh, it was found when they were building a parador, and in Spain, an archaeologist is required to be on the site, and the woman noticed a uh, 15th century wall. Anyway, fragments of that stucco are shown in the detail on the right that were found within the ruins, and it shows that even after the reconquest of Murcia, which took place a century before the synagogue was built, carved stucco had become a traditional decoration that was unconnected to the rule of a particular power. All right. And now we come to the project of the World Monuments Fund, um, the Dalan Synagogue in Fez, whose restoration in 1997 was encouraged by actions of the World Monuments Fund. It was built in the late 17th, uh, in the last third of the 17th century. And I have to say that just by chance, I was in Morocco during the rededication. Um, but I only had a slide of the rededication of the rabbi uh, carrying the Torah scroll into the synagogue, so I, I couldn't uh, get it made into a JPEG in time. In 1812, it became the synagogue of the Danan family, whose personal history exemplifies the peregrinations of Sephardi Jewry that I outlined before. In 1249, the first known member of the family left Morocco for the Kingdom of Aragon. His descendant, Maimon, left Spain after the massacres of 1391 and settled in Fez. His son, Moshe, became known as the Maimonides of Fez for his scholarship. 
Moses' descendants were all distinguished rabbis and scholars. The Danan Synagogue is a unique reflection of Spanish synagogues that did not survive, but which are known only from miniatures in Haggadot of the second quarter of the 14th century, that is in, Seder, uh, in, in books for the Passover Seder. Uh, but first, I'd like to uh, just talk about the plan, the elevation. These were all, these plans were done under the auspices of the World Monuments Fund. So what you have here are the uh, grills to the women's gallery. This is the Torah Ark that is built into the eastern wall with the women's gallery above it. And this wall abuts uh, the wall of the, the, the quarter in which the synagogue is in Fez, and that is the oldest wall. Um, on this side, you can see that there are three bay, uh, four bays. Uh, here are the, tower, the openings to the Torah Ark, and here is the reader's desk that was on the front of the invitation and that we'll look at. And what um, is very interesting is that there's a corridor and uh, there is a vestibule, and under the wall of the underneath, in the floor of the synagogue, beneath the women's gallery, there is a staircase that comes down from the floor and goes to the mikveh, the ritual bath. I, I honestly don't know of another um, example of, of this. Okay. Um, here is the arc wall, which is rather dark in the photograph to the left to give you a sense of the space. And here is the uh, very remarkable uh, reader's desk, which is built high up, a tradition in Arab countries uh, that uh, <coughs> emulates the prayer, the seat for the reader of the Quran. And to, to show you that it is a reflection of what may have existed in Spanish synagogues, this is the Barcelona Haggadah. Sorry. Um, these are all, um, all these Haggadot are, are 14, were, were created in the second quarter of the 14th century. And if you see here at the top of the reader's desk where the reader is holding up this case in which the Torah is, has this kind of architectural, same architectural cupola done uh, with simply with open spaces and wire as you see here. Uh, another asp this is a detail just so you can see it clearer. And uh, another, um, this is from a, a kind of awkwardly named Haggadah called the Sister of the Golden Haggadah. But in any case, the miniature shows you that the raised reader's desk was at some distance from the ark, which was built into the wall. Here's the opening. And the same is true of this ark. Behind the cabinets, the recess is in the wall where the scrolls uh, were kept. And finally, the famous Sarajevo Haggadah, about which there was a popular book written a couple of years ago, um, a novel, I should say, that uh, shows an open arc with these mantles that flare outward. And this is not from Danan, but from another synagogue. You can see that the same type of mantle that was used in Spain was used in lands of the Sephardi diaspora, uh, including Morocco. I, I, I want to talk now about the transfer of textiles from medieval Spain across the Mediterranean. One example of, uh, another example of a Spanish textile, this one from the 15th century, which is in the Metropolitan, and there's another there's another um, example of this pattern that's on display now in the new galleries. Uh, this same pattern reappears in a garment called a fez belt, which goes back uh, to 16th or 17th century. The example um, that you see there is, is modern, around 1900. These belts were worn with marriage customs and uh, in general everyday wear by both men and women. And if you look at this pattern, you can see that we're talking about the same pattern continue uh, in Morocco. Uh, the same transmission occurs uh, between this 
on the left, the 13th century textile from Spain, and this embroidery, uh, which dates to the 17th or 18th century, um, and was made in Tetuan by Jews. It was a skill uh, labor of Jews, and if you look again, the, the crossed uh, rectangle or squares that result in the star appear also in the textile. These uh, embroideries were made in Tetuan and then sent to Chef Shawin a little to the east, uh, where other Jews put them on larger textiles. They decorated bedspreads and wall hangings and the like. And finally, as an example of the transmission uh, of textile forms, I would I'm sure many of you know these bridal dresses that were worn with fez belts. They're called the Keswa el Kabira, or Grand Costume. They're mentioned in travelers' accounts as early as the 17th century as being a distinctive part of Moroccan costume, and they are worn only by women of Sephardi descent. They're made either of silk velvet or taffeta, and they consist of uh, skirts uh, and bodices uh, that you can see. This is the underlying bodice like an undershirt and then there's a jacket. Jacket always has seven buttons to symbolize the blessings at the uh, marriage. And then you get various patterns which symbolize fertility. On the skirt, these are rising arcs um, that have this symbolic meaning. And they're worn with very wide sleeves, which were called Muslim sleeves. The same costume elements are mentioned in a protocol of the Jewish communities of Castile, which met in Valladolid, Spain in 1432. They ruled that only a bride or an engaged woman the year before her marriage could wear, and this is a quote, translation from the Spanish, they are the only ones who could wear garments with more than one panel of gold cloth or of silk or silk taffeta. Neither the, shall they wear trimmings of gold cloth or of silk on their gowns, nor dresses with trains more than three meters in length, nor a dress of bright red color, nor cloaks embroidered in polychrome silks, nor Moorish garments with sleeves more than two palms width. So what we get out of the protocols is what is embodied in uh, this luxurious dress um, that became and is still uh, part of the wedding ceremony in, in Morocco amongst Fardim. And at the end, as the bride is being dressed and taken to her father-in-law's house, the women who attend her sing verses in Spanish. Finally, I should note that there were two Portuguese printers who settled in Fez, Samuel Ben Isaac and his son Isaac Ben Samuel, and they published the first book printed on the African continent in 1521, a Sefer Abudraham, a commentary on Jewish blessings and prayers that also included a treatise on the calendar. To conclude, in the arts of the Sfar, of the Sephardi or Spanish diaspora, that which includes North Africa, a process of selection took place. Artistic and architectural genres that were already important in the diaspora, for example, metallic embroidery and raised reader's desks that resemble chairs for the reader of the Quran, continued to be created by Jews and flourished due to new models in the art of host countries. Other imported types with no parallels in the art of the diaspora often disappeared unless they were deemed to be of great symbolic importance. The marriage costumes of Sephardi brides are an example of North African Jewish art that served as a reminder of a glorious age in Spain. To this day, in Jewish marriage contracts of Sephardi families, the name of the family is followed by the phrase, among the, those expelled from Castile. Thank you.
a fascinating lecture. And um, I also, it's always great to see images that you've never seen before. It makes it um, not only worthwhile to come to the lecture, but it makes you realize how much there still is to learn about I, these I have to just comment that I, I thought about these dresses yesterday, and three <laughs> students came in to discuss their final papers, and three students wanted to do them on bridal dresses. The third one who came in, I just started laughing. <laughs> Do you want to put the light up? Me, oh. yeah. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, I think oh. there. Um, well, it's still because we're still filming for uh, to be able to put this on the website. So. Nobody. You stunned everybody in silence. <laughs> well, maybe people have questions they would like to ask you privately. So with that, I'm going to thank you once again. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. In, in Toledo, there, there were several, I, I was there years ago, there were several structures that were thought were synagogues that were converted. Were there not? The, well, I showed you two. One is Santa Maria La Banca, and the other is the one built by the treasurer to take her to the pool. The, those are the two that still exist in Toledo. Then there's the one in Cordoba, and there's one in, Sport, in Portugal in the north, in Tomar, that is a Gothic building, as you would expect because it's next to France. And the local one is newly, it's, you know, newly discovered and was built in the 15th century. And what's remarkable about the one in Lorca is that they excavated the Jewish quarter around it. They have found close to 20 houses, and that has never been found uh, and, and surrounding uh, a synagogue. Where, you know, where is that located? It's in the south. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's this region that fronts on the Mediterranean on the, on the east and goes inland a bit. It's basically, Lorca was a garrison town between the Muslim area of Andalusia and Castile, and the Christian area. And there was a big fort there, and the Jews lived around the fort, which was very usual in Spain during the Middle Ages, because they basically worked in the courts, I mean the royal courts, uh, not, not the legal courts. that a major rub from Germany, who was Ashkenazi, was fleeing pogroms in Germany and came and became the head of the legal, the rabbinical court in Toledo. And he died in 1320s. So he came in 1304, and because the customs were then so close, he could become the chief you know, legal authority in Toledo, which is something we don't think about. This divergence that took place happened later. And even though he was a big uh, authority in Ashkenaz, he could function in Toledo. Yeah? Um, many of the motifs that you showed in the slides, you know, have remained alive in mm -hmm. the, um, 
Moorish synagogues that were built in, in the U.S. and around the world in the latter part of the 19th century. In fact, I, I'm involved in restoring one Moorish synagogue in Newark, New Jersey. And I think it's either the only or one of the few grants from the Jewish Heritage Program that went to a, a domestic project. You know, this is all part of a larger movement, to, uh, a Moorish revival movement that, you know, when we were children, we used to go to these huge movie theaters, many of them um, decorated in this fashion, and there were Yiddish theaters in New York, um, and Yeshiva University uh, is has one building left that was built in Moorish more style, and... Um, among my father's papers, I found a brochure from 19, I don't know, late 20s, in which the campus is being laid out for the future and there are minarets. Oh. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a hoop, you know. <laughs> I gave it to the, to the library there. Uh, but this was a, you know, it was a style. It was particularly a style that evolved in Europe for synagogues because uh, they didn't want synagogue when when uh, uh, emancipation happened in the 19th century, uh, with Jews being given political rights in various countries. They started to build larger houses of worship on main thoroughfares, big buildings, and there was a lot of discussion about what was an appropriate style because they didn't want to build in the style of churches. And ironically, um, they started building in Moorish style to evoke the Holy Land, that they were, their origins were in the Holy Land. So at the same time that they were finally being accepted as political entities in, in these countries, they were declaring that they came from somewhere else, you know, in their architecture, so. Well, I think I'm gonna just add one comment to that because it'll cue up what might be a future lecture for us. I think it's one of the things very interesting about Subhatice, which Sarah showed mm -hmm. at the very beginning, is that that was an attempt very much to be part of the modern world in a lot of ways, but again, using historic motifs. But what's interesting today is that synagogue is one of the most prominent pieces of architecture in the city of Subhatice, and a very similar style and that set of motifs was applied on the city hall. So the two most prominent mm -hmm places you might visit in Subhatice um, that flank a uh, main square are the synagogue and city hall in this very distinctive um, style of the turn of the century. Um, and um, Sarah didn't mention it, but the synagogue design was actually submitted for a competition for a building in Hungary, but and it, it was second place, so it wound up in Subhatice. But, um, but now it's very interesting, it's all been united with this regional tourism program, so maybe that's something we'll come back and talk about on another occasion. But you know, all of these things are so interwoven and it's fascinating, this long trajectory of tradition that continued across centuries and even continents. Mm -hmm. so, thank you once again. This was thank a you. fantastic. <laughs>